Hello everyone and welcome to Mr. Simplifies Tutorials. In this video we're going to look at Hofstadter's model of national cultures. Uh, what's the rationale behind this model? Now as we all know we live in a world populated by different people from different cultures uh, and for effectively communicating and cooperating with people from, uh, from other nations and cultures uh, it is extremely important to understand what is called their national culture. Now Hofstadter believed that when people communicate, they do so in their own local accent and they also actually think, feel and process information in their own local accents. Now these accents are acquired uh, where and when people grow up and this is what constitutes their national culture. So it's actually, it's actually the influence of where people grow up and this, the influence that this has on people's personalities, people's uh, way of speaking, people's way of proce processing information, all of this constitutes their national culture. It's important to understand this concept, obviously, to bridge the gap between cultures and understand one another in a global organization. He believes that, he believes that all countries and cultures in the world face the same problems and these problems can be categorized into six parts and these six parts constitute the 6D model that we're going to look at. It's important to also note that there are rankings in each model and these rankings are not absolutes. They are actually subjective to one another. They're all related to one another. Now let's look at the 6D model graphically and now let's look at each one, each, each dimension in detail starting from the most important one which is power distance. Now power distance is the extent of unequal power distribution that exists in a culture. Now this definition is the, takes the perspective of the less powerful members of the society. So defining power distance requires input from people at the bottom because it's their measure of how equal or unequal the society essentially is. Hofstede believe, believes that all societies are essentially unequal but this, this metric, this dimension is a measure of the intensity of the inequality. In countries with a high power distance, inequality is the norm of life and is accepted by the society. And in such societies, inequality exists to an extent that the less powerful people think of the more powerful people as superior beings. It's, it exists to the, to the extent that societal rules can change depending on how powerful a person is. And in such countries, there is absolute centralization of power and there can even be oligarchy. Uh, and, and in such countries or cultures or societies, uh, innovations can only come about when they are supported by people in power. So very centralized society. Now let's look at some numbers. Now these, these countries that, that are listed here are are just extracted from the, the data provided by Hofstede. So they're not all countries uh, we have data for, they're, they're only a selection. Now it's interesting to observe that countries uh, like Bangladesh, China or the Arab countries are really high power distance and Denmark is on the other hand, uh, other side of the spectrum with the least power distance. Now let's move on to the next one which is uncertainty avoidance. Now this is the extent to which the members of a society feel threatened about vague or, or, or amb ambiguous or unknown situations. Now this isn't about risk avoidance by the way. It's more about situations which are completely unknown and unanticipated. Uncertainty avoiding societies tend to resist uncertainty and thereby can be very stressed out by any amount of uncertainty. In accepting societies, uncertainty ex is, is accepted and is the norm and therefore doesn't cause much stress or aggression. Now avoiding countries tend to be uh, more regulated and de-avoiding countries or accepting countries tend to be uh, deregulated. So there aren't enough, uh, as, as much, as many regulations in uh, an, an accepting country rather. So let's look at some numbers here. Uh, we can once again see that, uh, very interestingly enough, the, the countries at the top of the spectrum are countries like Japan and countries like pa Italy and Pakistan. And at the bottom of the spectrum, you've got Singapore, you've got Denmark, 
and you've got Great Britain. Now let's move on to the next one which is individualism versus collectivism. An individualist society is one where essentially the perspective of the society is individualist is individualistic rather uh, and the ties between individuals is quite loose. A collective society is one in which individuals are parts of or are taken care of by larger groups of individuals which can be their extended families, communities, etc. So you can see where I'm going here. Uh, collective societies by their very nature can be very exclusive which means uh, people that are not part of a particular group can be seen as outsiders and are often not welcomed whereas individualist societies can be universal so everybody is normally treated equally in such societies uh, now there can there can be various family and personal implications too between individualist and collective uh, societies for instance family relationships tend to be stronger in collective societies with lower divorce rates and on the other hand individualist societies tend to be wealthier because they just lay a higher amount of emphasis on wealth creation in comparison to collective societies now let's look at some numbers here it's uh, it's not surprising that uh, the Western world uh, and the Eastern world uh, 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 kind of exist on the opposite ends of the spectrum here so countries like the United States Great Britain Australia etc are uh, quite individualistic and uh, the the other side of the spectrum you've got you've got countries like you've got Pakistan you've got Bangladesh you've got China which are very collective and uh, very uh, very community driven you'd say now let's move on to masculinity and femininity I think the name for this model is is quite confusing for most people now it's very important to understand that masculinity actually refers to the notion of being assertive and being focused on material possessions and femininity is is is, is focused on ensuring a better quality of life for the family so it's not it's not a direct reference to the actual sexes uh, in feminine societies people try to balance work and life and in masculine societies work prevails over family life on an individual level masculine societies are expected to have guys who are who are tough and girls who are emotional it seems and uh, on a societal level masculine societies can actually in a, uh, see poverty as a result of laziness so basically they they could see poor people as as lazy and being responsible for their poverty really and in feminine societies people are a little more considerate and see poor people as unfortunate people or victims of circumstances now let's look at some numbers here so which are the the the, uh, the masculine countries then it seems Japan is quite masculine as per findings Italy is quite masculine and then uh, you've got the other end of the spectrum Norway and Denmark so the Nordic countries tend to be quite feminine so long-term versus short-term orientation now long-term oriented societies drive towards long-term goals and future rewards so this is quite evident from the nomenclature here and in short-term oriented societies uh, people and businesses look towards longer-term rewards longer-term goals uh, long-term societies can often value people who change and adapt as per the situation whereas short short-term societies value people who don't change much now long-term oriented society is always sort of follow the uh, support the middle grounds when it comes to conflict any sort of conflict and uh, and short-term oriented countries choose to be more influenced by extremes and fundamentalist beliefs now Hofstede believed that economically poor countries can actually benefit greatly uh, and over time by adopting a, a, a more long-term orientation because they tend to be uh, short-term more often than not now let's look at some numbers here so which are the the long-term oriented countries then 
you've got China, which is extremely long term, and Japan. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you've got the United States, you've got Australia, and you've got countries uh, from the from the West, really. Uh, now, indulgence versus restraint. Now, indulgent societies believe greatly in enjoying life and basically having fun and their manner of fun is quite unrestrained. It's quite free. Uh, whereas restrained societies have quite strict social norms and repress free gratification of human needs to a certain extent. So you can see, you can kind of see the trend already now with this one. Uh, in indulgent societies, people tend to feel more in control of their lives and in restrained societies, people tend to feel they're not in complete control of their lives. Indulgent societies therefore can have more optimistic attitudes and people generally feel that they're healthy and restrained societies have more pessimistic attitudes and people can feel that they are less healthy than they actually are. So they can actually feel worse than they actually are. Now let's look at some numbers here. Uh, you've got some indulgent countries here. Uh, and which are these indulgent countries? They're Australia, they're Denmark, the Great Britain and the rest uh, of the Western world. And then you've got, uh, you've got countries like Bangladesh, China, uh, India and well Pakistan's got a score of zero on this metric for some reason but uh, that's again kind of like dividing the east and the west I would say and there you go those are the uh, the six dimensions it's quite important to understand here uh, something that a lot of people complain about uh, when you look at your own country and culture you have to look at multiple dimensions you have to actually look at all dimensions you have to look at you have to look at this holistically because when you take multiple dimensions into consideration then think things can actually can actually be a bit more cohesive if you look at just one dimension you can just completely disagree with uh, the dimension and think that the whole thing uh, is not is not up to the mark really You'd be, you'd be disagreeing with it uh, entirely. But if you tend to look at it, look at multiple dimensions and look at it holistically, you could possibly see that uh, a lot of it actually does hold true. But not everything. It is actually quite, quite highly debated. And uh, to this date, it is quite highly debated and it will continue to, uh, to drive a lot of debate. Okay, I hope this was very helpful for you. I thank you very much for your attendance. And as always, like the content on this channel, uh, spread the word, share this content. And please, if you've got any suggestions, uh, any video topics that you want me to cover, please free to, feel free to use the comments. Thank you very much. Take care.